Good morning. This is the second part of Day 2, Week 5, Distance Learning of Module 9, Week 3, From Farm to Table. We just talked about the different text structures and how we're going to be reading in order to identify the text structures um, that we see. And the way we identify text structure is by looking for transition words. So, meanwhile, in the morning shade of the school, Paul hands out seeds to plant a waffle bed. The bed's low walls of adobe bricks help keep water in. Meanwhile, lets me know this may be a sequence structure because they're letting us know what's happening uh, at a, uh, during the time that something else is happening. Another group of students plant squash seedlings. Danielle helps a student transplant a tomato seedling. Once the seeds and seedlings are in the ground, the beds are watered and covered with a mulch of straw. This helps to keep the soil from drying out. I see the word mulch is highlighted and it's a hyperlink, which means it has the blue text and is underlined. And that means there's a sidebar with the word mulch in bold letters with a definition. And it says, if you put mulch in your garden, you put straw or wood chips around your plants to help protect them. So not only can we see a sequential transition word in paragraph 11 with meanwhile, we also see transition within paragraph 12. It talks about what a group of students is doing, which begins with transplanting a seedling, watering, and covering the seedlings with mulch. And this helps to keep the soil from dry drying out. Paragraph 13. A lot of water is needed to keep the garden healthy. When it rains, water flows off the road, down a drain pipe, and into an underground tank called a cistern. A solar panel on the roof of the outdoor cistern, excuse me, of the outdoor classroom, creates electricity to run the pump that draws water from the cistern. One of the student's favorite jobs is watering the garden. Miss Sue fills the colorful watering cans for them. So here in paragraph 13, we see a lot of specific vocabulary about the topic of how to get water for your garden. And a very environmentally friendly way to do this is using rainwater. So they explain the procedure or the sequence for collecting rainwater to have water for the garden. Paragraph 14, the tomato plants are surrounded by plastic tubes filled with water. During the day, the sun warms the water in the tubes. At night, the tubes provide the warmth that tomato roots need to grow. Then there is no rainwater in the, excuse me, when there is no water in the cistern, a hose attached to an outdoor faucet is used to keep the soil moist and plants healthy. So paragraph 14 is a little bit of a continuation on the sequence of providing water for the garden, but it also gives us a secondary purpose for the water. The water is not only used to provide moisture, it's also used to provide thermal energy, which means the sun warms the water in the tubes and that warms the roots of the plants so they can grow. Remember, not all places are as warm as Texas are in the spring. Paragraph 15, while the plants are growing during the warm spring days, there is a lot of work to do in the garden. Students mix sand, dirt, water, and cut up straw to make adobe bricks. The bricks are used to make the low walls for waffle beds. In the Southwest, adobe bricks are still used to build homes. Well, I'm making a text-to-text -text connection because I'm remembering in your social studies text, we read about how homes in the Southwest are made with adobe bricks because that is what they have available. They don't have forests, but they have lots of clay and straw. So they're able to mix that with water to make adobe bricks that help protect them from the heat of the sun. In addition to my connection, I also see that we're still reading about spring 
And we are also reading about how to make walls for the waffle beds. So I'm learning more about waffle beds because I don't really know what those are. But it sounds like they might be raised plant beds um, with the walls made from adobe, which is what they have accessible to them where they are. Maybe this takes place in Arizona or some state in the southwest. Paragraph 16. Adobe is used to coat the horno, the traditional oven used to bake bread. Every spring, the horno in the garden of the outdoor classroom gets a fresh coat of adobe. Hmm, this raises a question for me. Why would you need an oven for baking bread in a garden? Well, let's read and see if we can find out. There are many different plants in the herb garden, such as basil, chives, and sage. Every plant has its own taste and smell. This is more of a descriptive paragraph because it's giving us details about the plants in the garden. Radishes are harvested in the spring. Miss Sue asks some students to pick the radishes. After washing the dirt off them, the children bite into the bright red vegetables. One girl finds hers too spicy and drops it into the compost pile. More food for the worms. Well, I saw a series of events and I saw the transition word after. So what kind of structure do you think paragraph 18 has? I'll be asking you in our Zoom meeting. Paragraph 19. On special afternoons and weekends, the garden becomes a place where the school community gathers. Students come back. Students, sorry, students come back with their family and friends. They compost seed, plant, transplant, weed, water, and dig. By now, the flowers are blooming, one of our critical vocabulary words. And the beds are green. The garden is flourishing with so much care. Hmm, I'm not sure what flourishing means, but it has to do with care. So I guess flourishing must mean that the garden is doing well. Paragraph 20. Garden chores continue into summer. Oh, so we've gone from spring and now we're transitioning into summer. School is closed, but the garden is a beehive of activity. It provides the setting for music and gatherings of children, grown-ups, friends, and families. The music fills the garden with joy. So we had a transition word, continue, and we also read about how there's a metaphor between a garden and a beehive. Bees are seen as busy, so that means they're trying to say the garden is still busy, even though classes are finished. They say that now the families are kind of enjoying the garden more than working in the garden. It sounds like. Paragraph 21. As many, but excuse me, by August, many of the fruits and vegetables are ripe. Cooking and eating become an ongoing activity in the garden. So we're being asked, what is the structure of this part of the text? And how do we know? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, they're letting us know we're coming into fall now because they say by August. And they're talking about the vegetables being ripe. And we have some new activities, cooking and eating. Let's read a little more to get more information about the text structure on this page. A father helps the children make pizzas on one community day. First, they mix and punch the dough. Then, they roll it out with a rolling pin. Next, they pour oil on the flat dough. Ripe tomatoes are cut up and go on top. And last, of course, is the grated cheese. Well, definitely, we have a sequence. We have the words first, then, next, and then last. So those are definitely signal words, uh, letting us know that they're describing a sequence. Paragraph 22 is definitely sequential. Let's look at paragraph 23. After a hot fire burns down in the horno, the pizza goes in. 
When the sizzling pizza is taken out, a group of hungry gardeners appears. The slices disappear like magic. Fortunately, there are many more pizzas to come. So I see we have another transition word. We have after, and I can tell now that this is a sequence because first they pick the vegetables, then they make the dough, and last they put the toppings on before putting the pizza in the oven. And also, if you'll remember, I was wondering why they would need an oven in a garden. So I guess they use the oven to cook food that they make using ingredients from the garden. What simile does the author use in paragraph 23? I'm going to ask you that question during our Zoom meeting. And finally, why does the author use this figurative language? If you think back to the story about raising raisins, we discussed on our discussion board reasons why an author might use figurative language. I will ask you during our Zoom meeting today to recall some of those reasons. Great, now that we've done our reading, we're ready for some writing. And we've been working on an instructional manual paragraph. Remember, last time we saw that the book instructed us on planning the paragraph by dividing a paper into four sections. Next, we labeled each section with the name of a season. And just in my case, I started my seasons with fall, but if you like, you could also start with spring because the book starts with planting the seeds, which occurs in the spring. It also tells us that we need to reread the text and fill in the task excuse me, the tasks and activities that happen during each season. So now that you planned on day one, let's see what we do on day two. Now we're ready to write a draft. It says, now write your instruction manual that describes the tasks that must be done in the garden during each season. Make sure your instruction manual introduces the topic, summarizes the garden tasks that happen in all four seasons, is organized in a logical way, uses transition words like next, then, and after between topics, and also uses linking words. We hadn't talked as much about linking words. These are words like also, another, and more, and they connect related ideas. So let's make a list of what we need to do to write our draft. First, you need to think of a hook. Remember, that's something very interesting or a question or a surprising fact that can catch the reader's attention. The next sentence will describe tasks that occur in the fall. So you look at your four square plan in the square labeled fall. After you write the tasks that happen in fall, you write the tasks, tasks that occur during winter and then the ones in spring. You finally write a sentence describing tasks that occur in the summer and by writing a concluding sentence, something that leaves the reader with a thought. Remember to use transition words to help the flow of your sentences and to signal you're writing a sequence. Remember, it's an instruction manual, so this is how-to writing. Here are examples of transition words you can refer to. Again, they also ask us to use linking word words to connect the tasks within a paragraph. So if I have to plant seeds, water seeds, and cover seeds with mulch, I might say, under the related box, I, at first I need to plant the seeds. After I plant the seeds, another task I need to follow with is watering the seeds. Also, I want to cover the seeds with mulch to retain the moisture. That's an example of using linking words within a paragraph. So here is my example of the instruction manual for seasonal yard work. I'm writing about yard work, which is similar to planting a garden. And you can read this since we're almost out of time. I took my graphic organizer and I used that to write sentences about each season. Once I've done that, I make sure that I can see transition and linking words in my paragraph.